I'm going to try to narrate some of this. These are old, old outtakes off of VHS videotape. Yes! <laughs> Watch our sagebrush get pulled out of the ground. <laughs>
ourselves. We had been making short films where we did everything ourselves. And uh, we were kind of frustrated that writers, pretty much, once you write your script, they go off and make your movie. Like the short circuit, we didn't even know they had left town. We called the director with a new idea, and they said, well, he's not here. He's shooting your movie. <laughs> uh, so we would bug our agents and say, we want to do something where we have more control, more control. So well, you really want to produce. You want to write and produce. So we developed this idea from one of our old ideas of top underground dirt monsters that had we had sitting in our file cabinet and uh, um, then had a heck of a time selling it. <laughs> it was different enough that, that we took we pitched it all over town, meaning we would go and describe it to executives and they didn't get it. And then we wrote a 25 page treatment and they didn't get it. And then we wrote the screenplay and only one guy <laughs> that our agent sent it to, Jim Jacks at uh, at Universal, he was a real film buff. He really knew movies that he got. He said, wow, this is like an updated 50s monster movie. I love it. <laughs> so he fought for it, kicked and screamed. And then and Universal did get behind it. And the people that were in control there, they supported it all, all the way. It was in the second part to it. Oh, we're going to think it. It's well, yeah. that, you know, it wasn't a huge hit in the theaters. I think it sort of broke even. They were very disappointed. In fact, the head of Universal called me up and said, we blew the advertising on this thing. I'm really sorry. And because uh, nobody knew how to sell it, you know, it was this weird mix of comedy and horror. And, and, the, and the, the, the ad department, you know, it, they tried. They were, it was a hard thing to sell. And so it did okay. But then VHS video came along, and suddenly it's this huge hit in video. And they called us up a few years later and said, uh, um, uh, it was sort of a backhanded compliment. I thought they said, you know, we could sell an empty box called Tremors. <laughs> so we have to have terms too. So the video division said we have to have terms too. We must have it. You can either do it or not. You when know, you sell a screenplay, you sell it outright. You don't have anything to say. You have no control over it for the rest of your life. The studio has complete control of the material. So they could make terms too without us. So we sat down and we said, well, gee, let's try to come up with terms too, and let's try to get everybody back. Mm -hmm. We flew to New York and tried to talk Kevin into it, and Kevin didn't want to do it. He, he, he actually, uh, we didn't know this at all at the time, but Kevin thought this was the low point of his career. <laughs> he, he was really, and, and you would, I mean, I didn't know this until years later. I mean, he couldn't have been more professional. He couldn't have been more great, uh, great to work with. And, uh, and I think it's one of his best performances ever. Yeah. Uh, and I think he would agree. You know, granted, your fans, but... Uh, <laughs> So he didn't want to do it, so that meant it couldn't be a feature. Universal said, if Kevin does it, it's a feature. If he doesn't do it, it's a direct video. 
So he didn't want to do it. And uh, so Fred was willing to come back. So we had to rewrite our script and you know, take, take the Valentine Keir character out. The script was, too, was written with Valentine or continuing that adventure. And then everybody else, though, the effects team, the monster guys, uh, uh, just everybody, you know, was happy to come back and do it, even to work on a low budget, it was much more low budget, uh, uh, direct -to video thing. And the same with Tremors 3 and Tremors 4. And the team kept coming back, <laughs> which was great for us because uh, they enjoyed working. You know, and everybody took pride in it. It was, they liked that we were trying to make the world fit and to add to the monsters, you know, to not break the rules, you know, and make the sequels, everything fit together, that kind of thing. So we were very lucky. I mean, we were really lucky that, that Michael Gross was willing to come down. I remember on Tremors 3, he said, I'm not sure we should keep doing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so going off of what you said, it sounded like you wanted to have more control over over the movie. What was that like as a writer when they were actually in production? You mentioned you were on set, you were seeing dailies. Um, you know, how much creative input were you able to have at that point? Oh, we were we were we were crazy with input. I mean, first of all, Ron was a longtime friend of ours. Ron had hired us to make our first movies way back when we were making short movies by ourselves. This is the director? Ron, the director, Ron Underwood. And Ron had stayed in the short movie world. He, he was making movies back in the day that were shown in schools when they would roll the projector out in the classroom. Mm. Anybody remember that? <laughs> uh, 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 but that, that was a fairly big market. There was a lot of schools and libraries to sell to. So Ron had stayed in that. We had sold Short Circuit. We were kind of Hollywood guys. <coughs> so when this opportunity came up, we got the interest in it. We said, we want to attach Ron to it. You know? um, I'm, I'm rambling again. <laughs> uh, how much, how involved were oh, you during the Oh, that was my point, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> then we drove around completely crazy. We were all over it all the time. Yeah. In the famous scene in the basement when uh, Michael says the line, and we kind of knew this line was going to be an important line. We broke into the wrong goddamn restroom. <laughs> uh, uh, we were all very uptight about it. Michael was uptight about it. Ron was. We were. Oh God, we gotta get it right, we gotta get it right. So <laughs> we do the scene. Michael would say the line, and then me and Brent would run over to Ron and a confab. So finally <laughs> Michael came and said, let's have this conversation all together, shall we? Because <laughs> it was bugging him. Uh, so we backed off a little bit. But yeah, we had a tremendous amount of input, and that's where I, I got the directing with that. I directed second unit on the show because it got big enough and Universal was kind enough to give us a budget for a second unit. So a lot of the bits and pieces that are very hard to get when the main unit is shooting, like the close-ups of tentacles and that kind of stuff, I ended up shooting with, with the second unit, which got to be huge. It was like 100 people or something. Wow. It was crazy. Um, or we thought it was crazy. I mean, it's, it's typical for a real movie, but we were a little bit. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, yes, we have tremendous amount of input, and, and it's, it's still, for an overall experience in Hollywood, with all the experiences I've had, it's the best in terms of creative input. And it was it was a big learning curve for me and Brent, who are the primary right guys on this, uh, because you have to have a staff, you have to have people cranking out scripts. So you have uh, what do we have, four or five people that we hired uh, who came in to write scripts, sometimes based on our stories, but mostly based on their own stories, and it. Tremors, we didn't even know this, it's it's a hard thing to do, this weird mix of comedy and horror. It's hard to get it right, at least in our egomaniacal <laughs> view of things. Um, so the first scripts that they wrote, we had to drastically rewrite, and we were exhausted and they were upset. And, and, uh, but you know, fortunately, Michael came back to me again, and, and he was executive producing, and, and he was kind of our anchor on the set. It was, the show was shot in Mexico, which made things vastly more difficult. <laughs> and uh, the studio felt that we would save money. I can't believe that we saved money, given what we wasted to bribes and everything else. I think I'm kidding. But it, so it was, a, it was a, I mean, it's the TV, every feature guy does this when they go into TV. It's, it's, a, it's a nightmare, you know, it's, it's, it's a machine that eats material as fast as you can write it. So in that sense, it was hard, but it was fun. You know, like I say, Michael was our anchor in Mexico. He understood the show and he, he could kind of, you know, oversee things down there and kind of 
get the directors going in the right direction because the directors didn't know Turner's either. They were coming in, they just directed, you know, CSI. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, the first guy thought, oh, when the grab lights come, the camera should do this. <laughs> oh, the shell should do this. <laughs> It was fun. I wish we'd gotten a second season because we had a whole bunch of ideas for the second Aww. season. We didn't, we didn't quite get there. Fair share any? Anyway. Uh, yeah, anybody else? Anybody else? Any questions? Gentlemen in the back. Uh, what, if you can remember, what are some of the most ridiculous uh, studio notes that you've gotten from execs on a screenwriting? On oh, Tremors? Or a screenwriter? Or on any script. Oh. <laughs> well, well, on any script. Some pretty, pretty it gets pretty extreme. Like I say, again, the, the studio was, other than the studio desperately wanting to know where the graboids came from, <laughs> uh, they, they really did not like the scene where we throw out all the ideas. Because there's only four fantasy things that can come from. So they said, we want to know. We wrote the scene, and then we gave the script out, and the, uh, uh, and the team came together for a big production meeting. We, we wrote they were from outer space. We wrote Bert, when he was out with Heather in those, in those scenes, he found a spaceship and eggs. Oh. And uh, we never shot that scene, but we wrote it. And the, and the whole team said, what? This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back, and I said, OK, the 150 production people said, this is an awful idea. <laughs> And, and the studio guy said, okay, take it out. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll give you, I'll try to give you, I don't want to go to my whole career here. Uh, 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 here's the strangest note. This was on the Wild Wild West. Uh, not much of our script was left in the Wild Wild West. <laughs> uh, uh, but if those of you who have seen it, there's a big mechanical steampunk spider. In, in, that's a huge, and I, I love that. Thing. That was our idea. Uh, for a long time, that was a stealth bomber, and, the, and because the guy, the, the main producer on that movie, insisted that it should be a stealth bomber, and we said, okay, you, you understand that it's 1880. <laughs> he said, I don't care, the stupid spider's not scary, a stealth bomber is scary. <laughs> Rivets or anything like that? You know, could it be made of iron? Maybe. <laughs> absolutely true. And so Colonel Grafton, until Barry Sonnenfeld got the script, it wasn't really a step. We, we tweaked it to where it was a kind of a steampunk flying machine. And Barry Sonnenfeld came in at one point at a big meeting just as the movie was getting ready to go. A huge meeting with a billion people in it because it was a big movie, so everybody was in the meeting. People you don't even know. People went, I don't even work at the studio. Or <laughs> uh, and, and he said, you know, I kind of don't like to hear this high voice. And I kind of won't like the flying machine because it means I'm going to be in the air a lot and I'm not going to know where I am. And there's a lot of blue screen and a lot of just seeing sky. And I'm, I'm in the back of this gigantic room full of executives. I said, you know, Mr. Zlanafeld, there is a version of the script with a giant walking spider. Oh, I'd like to see that. <laughs> I kid you, this is all true. And a studio executive stood up, stood up, and said, I really support that idea, Mr. Sonnenfeld. Yeah. <laughs> now the spider was back. <laughs> yeah, Wild Wild West was probably our craziest of I'll come back to that sometime. Except I won't be able to tell you anything about the movie, because you know, they fired us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, anybody else? Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, I've been following Michael Gross on Facebook, and there's going to be a new Tremors movie, from what I've heard. Yes. Are you involved in the search? Sadly, no. No! Sadly, no. I was going to say, is there anything fun you can tell us about it, but no? <laughs> oh! I, I know almost nothing about it. That's actually um, kind of disappointing, then. I, well, I can tell you briefly what happened. Uh, it was 10 years, I guess, since Tremors 4. They, we had written Tremors 5 10 years ago, because they were going to make Tremors 4 and Tremors 5 back-to-back. The bottom fell out of the DVD market, and, and to this day, no one quite knows why. I think you know why you should tell Hollywood, because they're really baffled by it. But people just stop buying DVDs. And um, so they put Tremors 5 on the shelf, and they forgot about it. And for years, I was telling fans, no, there's no chance there's never going to be a Tremors 5. And then one day, they called us and said, we would like you to rewrite your script for Tremors 5, but we remind you that your, your contractual uh, attachment to Tremors has expired. So we don't want you to do anything else on it because we don't think you have the skill to do a low-budget movie. 
<laughs> and we said, well, maybe you should rewrite it yourself. <laughs> no, we, we, were, we were stunned. We still, that's all we know. You, you, know. you have these negotiations between your agent and their executives, and you get everything third hand. So that's all I know anyway. You, you know, the people that were doing negotiating may know more. But, uh, but yeah, so it just went off and got made. It's already been shot. Michael decided to do Bert, which, why not? Why could he not? Yeah. And uh, yeah, shot in South Africa. That, I know that. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Uh, pardon me? That would say that's what I've heard. That yeah. he was, he's not been so. posting pictures from Africa. Yeah. So. And it's done, and it's in Canada, and it comes out for some reason much later in the year. Hmm. It, it's on its way. Well, that's kind of a shame. Jamie Kennedy. Yeah, it's a shame that you're <laughs> working all I know. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> Almost makes me not want to watch it, but <laughs> got to. Well, it might be good. It might. <laughs> yeah. I just real quick, what's next for you then? I am. Um, uh, my partner like because we write original ideas, we're having a heck of a time to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> In Hollywood right now, it's it's you know mainstream Hollywood, which is kind of where we were. We we kind of leapfrog right out of short films into you know short circuit. Uh, is all about remakes and sequels now. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a quick example. I, um, uh, one of our pitches that we did in the last few years, we, we could you still get in the C Studio executives, you know, and we pitched in this. I said, God, I love this. Thing. Thank God. <laughs> Can't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not based on anything. Said, yeah, it's wow. an original idea. Mm -hmm. He said, No, no, if it was a comic book or something, that'd be great. Said, no, yeah. <laughs> so I've written it as a book, which will be for sale. Uh, <laughs> 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 if the book sells well enough, <laughs> I actually did turn the story into a novel, just out of sheer frustration. But, What's it called? I, I like the idea. My, my, my partner and I did. Yes, who else? Anyway. Yes, yes, back there in the red shirt. Oh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> My Orido poster. Really. <laughs> yes. um, I think that Wally is an abomination. <laughs> and I think it's a blatant ripoff of number five. Yeah. Given that instead of I pursuit of too. knowledge, he's going for pursuit of a pretty robot. <laughs> How do you feel about Wally compared to number five? There were, the odd, the only odd thing to me about it was that I read an interview. I don't, I've never talked to the people who made that movie, but I read an interview with them where someone asked them that question: "Did Number Five influence you in any way?" And they said, "Absolutely not." Goddamn lie. That's the only thing I found odd. I mean, if they had just said, "Sure, we like Number Five, that would have been." Yes. Uh, Tremors is one of my two or three favorite horror comedies. I'm, at, I'm actually in the process of trying to write a horror comedy at the same time, but I'm having trouble mixing horror and comedy. I have scenes that are horrific, I have scenes that are funny, but nothing where I mix the two. Did you have that kind of trouble mixing horror and comedy? And if so, what did you do to work through it? In our case, the drafts previous to the draft we shot were too funny. Mm -hmm. And the rule that we applied to, to pull the other back out of it was never make fun of the monsters, never have anybody say a funny line just because it's a funny line. It has to come out of the moment like Michael's line, like many of the lines do. <laughs> try to make sure that, it, it's, it's, it's an old saw, but it's true. You just try to make sure that people are doing as much as possible what they would do in an extraordinary situation. Mm -hmm. That's what we did on, on Tremors. Yeah, and, and that was the problem we had with the series. Everybody came in writing funny. We had all these these sitcom writers writing, <laughs> writing you know, uh, uh, you know, Jody Chang is drunk one morning, and we're like, no, Jody's a workaholic. She's never drunk. So, that kind of stuff. But yeah, that, that's what you know. It's the comedy has to come out of the situation. Okay, so that's what I try to do. Yes. Over there. Yeah, I love your movie, and it's really an honor to be watching it with you. And one thing, it's a movie that I watch over and over again. One thing I always like to do is I think about, like, if you removed a protagonist from a movie, would the results be different? Would the output be different? Like, if there was no Ripley and Aliens, what would have happened? If there was no John McClane, if he stayed home, what would have happened? Do you think if Val and Earl had made it to town, would everybody in perfection have just died? Or would they have been able to kind of pull it together and still survive? Well, Bert would they have Bert. Bert. Yeah, money for their money. But I think they would have been in trouble. They would have been too handy, man. And, and Val and Earl came out of 
the off, our, our, our feeling of, of we were doing it, we knew we were doing a Japanese monster movie. I mean, I did. I mean, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the geeky guy, I'm the geeky guy of, of our company because I'm the one who's begging them to get this, uh, the outtakes that you saw. Nobody was interested in that. It's 25 years ago before, you know, DVDs with extras and all that stuff. Now they shoot all this stuff. I'm, I'm clinging to old VHS cassettes and dragging around the cock and, the, and nobody cares. But we knew that we didn't want all the standard characters that are in the old sci-fi movies. And, and I do think that the talent probably wouldn't make it to that film. Most of them wouldn't. Heather and Bert, well even Heather and Bert, because they didn't understand that if they stayed in their house it was going to get torn down. You know? Mm -hmm. okay. so now are all those those Midwestern can-do people who just figure out how to do stuff. Yes? Uh, I love your personalities in your show. Um, I'm just wondering, how do you come up with all the little subplots, like the rock, paper, scissors, and the, the plan? And, yeah. and there's all these things that just make these characters, are they from your personal life, or I mean, where do you get these? Uh... A great deal of that comes from my partner, Brent. A lot, although I think I wrote the, the rec room line. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm always amazed. Uh, Brent, Brent is just a very quirky guy, and he's the guy with, you know, Val just doesn't grab the radio. They hang him by his feet, and Brent, when he gets the radio. Uh, and he did write a lot of those quirky lines. Here's some Swiss cheese and bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody over here, I saw. Yes. Yeah, I've always been curious. How did the idea of the Tong and the Grab Boys come about? Because it could have been like a generic, typical war, but I get, I think the Tongs make it such a more unique creature. You know, that was purely because we were on such a low budget. We <laughs> <laughs> you know, were, and this is true, we, 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 we sold this idea to, to Ron and the studio, and hey, they're underground, you never see them, there's no special effect, there's no CG in this movie because it didn't exist. And, uh, and, and then Ron said, yeah, but I can't never see them. And we started thinking, we were talking to the effects guys, uh, Tom and Alec uh, of ADI, and, and we were saying, what if, what if they had a, something small that could come up? Brent kept saying, hand puppet. They eventually made it, a, tr a tentacle hand puppet. They had, we had really complicated ones that were beautiful mechanical things that you operated with levers, but they eventually made a hand puppet, which we used quite a bit. And it, it came out of that. We said, we've got to be able to see them without dealing with this eight foot tall, you know, you know 80 pound, 100 pound thing with a guy inside of it. <laughs> you know, for those scenes where it bursts out of the ground, and it only happens like three times in the movie, it's like a day of seven. And he buried the guy alive for several hours. <laughs> <laughs> he had a video camera and a headset. And we would set, lower him down on the elevator, and then cover him over the dirt, and then the crew would get ready, and the actors would get ready, and the would be doing anything up there, you know. It's a billion degrees. We, had a guy, we actually had a guy look for rattlesnakes before we lowered him down. Crazy. Yeah, but the tentacles were a, a low budget solution to the monster. There was somebody there, yes. Oh, yes. Uh I've seen this movie numerous times in the old days of VHS with my daughters, and there's one question that they asked, they said, you have to ask them, and it's a question that's been bugging them for years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, why couldn't they all fit on the bulldozer? You know, I thought, I thought that tonight. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that was bugging me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's something way back there. Again. Way back here. Um, I was curious about your influences, but also um, I was wondering if you considered crowdsourcing because tons of artists have worked really well for them. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite hear you. Uh, your influences, whether as a writer or director or whatever, but also um, in terms of funding your projects, have you considered crowdsourcing? Because it's worked. Oh, oh, oh. Really, for a lot of artists. Yes, but fans have talked to us about crowdsourcing for years. I answer all the questions on the Stampede website. Stampede is our, is our company. And um, we, we actually, just before Term, uh, Universal told us that, that they didn't want us to do Terminus 5, um, we had asked them about, about crowdsourcing. If, if we came up with half of Universal Pick in the other half, so we haven't pursued it beyond that, and, and right now we're, we're in a different universe. We're trying to, uh, we're, we're, my partner and I are working on a, on a TV pilot, and, uh, because that's where, all the, that's where all the original ideas are being done, you know, and we don't have a big foothold there other than, other than the series. 
as far as influences go, the 50s monster movies. <laughs> I grew up watching all that stuff, Ray Harryhausen, um, and uh, uh, reading a lot of science fiction, uh, and, 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 and action. I'm not really an ordinary people kind of guy. I'm mostly action and monsters. <laughs> Saw somebody else there, yes. When writing it, did you have a favorite character? Did I what? Have a favorite character. I don't think so. We really like we really liked all of our characters. We thought a long time about who would be in this little town. Brent and I had both done, we lived in Southern California and we did a lot of camping out in deserts and going to weird little towns and, and meeting these people. And we were uh, not I, I can't say we have a favorite really. We, we, we like them all. I mean, I think Bird is fun to write for because he's so over the top. You know? <laughs> yeah. But that's just, that's fun to do. It's, Bird is easy. It's harder to write the people who are more realistic. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so. Uh, to what extent did you write the action scenes, like the no dialogue action only scenes in this specific script? In terms of everything. Everything was worked out. And then Before it ever hit and production. Then, oh yeah, and then storyboarded after that, worked out with the directors, worked out with the effects and stunt people. We were big believers, and we had to be. I mean, yes, we had a lot more money than we had on the other movie, on the later movies, but uh, it was still a low budget movie. And you, you, you couldn't get out there and just be making it up as you went. Right. Uh, we, we worked it out in great detail. It's pretty much exactly what we wrote. There's some funny inventions in there. The one that always strikes me funny, because I thought it was an accident, was when Kevin jumps off the roof. It's actually the stunt guy who takes the fall, but he hits the piece of roof that's already loose and it breaks. And I called Ron, I saw the daily, I said, Ron, oh my God, is the stunt guy okay? He said, no, no, we planned the whole thing. Oh. <laughs> so, yes? Yeah, the character of Valentine, now was there other actors that were Oh, yeah. Like Boy, this is where uh, Ron would be great, because Ron remembers this stuff much better than I do. Uh, there were many people considered. Bill Paxton was considered. Uh, the studio sent us after Kevin. The studio was worried about this movie. You know, they told us, you have to read Reba McIntyre, even though she's never done a movie before. Yeah. You have to read Michael Gross, even though he's family ties. <laughs> oh, and we were so lucky. I mean, Reba came in and she blew us away. And Michael came in and, and literally jumped up on Ron's desk doing a graboid thing. Oh! And Ron out. Michael was just a thing. We couldn't believe it was the family type guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we were lucky because the, the studio was doing what they do. They were trying to shore up the movie, you know, give it every element could. And the, 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 and the linchpin was, was Kevin Bacon. Even though Bill Paxton was considered, he wasn't as big a star. Uh, believe it or not, um, an agency, one of the agencies, uh, really pushed Michael Caine for the Red, Fred Ward. Really? Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> because a lot of people were going to talk about it. But when the studio realized that Kevin was available, they sent Ron off to, it was a heart in the throat moment for us. They sent Ron to lunch with Kevin Bacon and said, come back with him or you don't want to move these things. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. One more, one more. Yes. I really enjoy your shirt circuit movie, the first and the second. So I'd like to know, what was your influence for creating such a plot? For, for which one? Short Circuit. Oh, short Circuit. Uh, well, I happen to know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I had been doing short films for schools and libraries, and I was an animator. I thought I was going to be an animator before I, I discovered writing and directing. And um, we had done a short film that featured a, a puppet animation robot, a, you know, a, a model that you would animate with stop motion animation. And it uh, was a huge success. It sold extremely well. And the robot character was very popular. So that's why my partner and I said, Ron said, well, you guys, we should write a script with a robot in it. <laughs> so, and then we said, well, okay, what's different? Why don't we do this different? And what struck us was that every robot in every major movie is already considered to be alive. They just play that joke right from the start. R2-D2, you know, he gets angry, angry when c 3 p is afraid all the time. You know, and, and, and all the robots prior to that, that's always been the joke, and we thought, well, really, nobody would buy that at all. 
Nobody would think that at all. So that's how we came up with the basic idea of he is alive and nobody believes it. Um, uh, but that, yeah, that it came out of this short film that we did that, that was, I mean, hugely successful. It sold to, you know, 15,000 schools. <laughs> Big money in those days. And you were saying you were a geek, right? Did that have an impact on that movie? It, the one that we wrote, the short, the short Yes, movie. you said you're kind of nerdy and oh. you're... <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just, you know, I'm a film buff guy. And, oh. you know, I love, you know, when I was a kid, it was famous monsters of film mm -hmm. land, you know, three pictures from some weird movie that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, those are all my influences, really. There, yes. Are vacuums good for parties? Are <laughs> vacuums good for parties? Vacuums. <laughs> it's one of the lines in the uh, beginning. Oh, he lugs yeah. around the vacuum. Oh, the red line. I didn't even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got time for maybe one or two more. If anybody's got some question they're dying to ask, looking pretty good. Oh, last one. It's you. You mentioned you're the sci you like sci-fi novels. Who's your favorite author? Well, I go back a ways. I have, I, I, I confess, I got busy enough <laughs> in Hollywood that I, I, did, I haven't read a lot of current stuff. But I was, you know, uh, I like Highland, Peter Sturgeon, Amy Van Vogt, um, uh, 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 those guys, that era. That's the stuff I read. Oh, that's fantastic. Cool. Brad well, <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank how, you. How can folks keep track of what's next? How can they keep up with you? Well, I do have a Facebook page, SS Wilson. That's easy to find. I try to remember to put stuff on there. <laughs> and, you know, and a lot of it is, you know, I'm just writing, so I don't want to put on Facebook. Yes, I, I wrote another draft of the TV pilot today. <laughs> but stuff like this is on there. So. Cool. Well, we can't wait to see what's next, Thank and um, and thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, you. maybe we'll bring back some more of your films. Yeah, I can come in like I said. I can, I can do uh, Wawa West. We would love to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Harry's> not <included. laughs>